So explain the three spring car. Yeah. So that car had 62% left side weight and uh, 52% rear weight. And so it was loose everywhere I went. It was fast. We were breaking the track records, but that was the year that uh, I broke my ankles and we put Daryl in the car. And I told him before we went, I said, we're going to break the track record and win the race. And we did. But, and I knew we could break the track record because I just set the track record there and it was way too loose. So I fought loose all the time. And I noticed when I'd get home and unstrap the right rear on the trailer to unload the car, that the spring would be about an inch away. The right rear spring would be about an inch away from the adjuster. It wasn't like that when I'd leave the house, but when I'd get home with the fuel burned off, it would be so, you know, a, it'd be all, you know, away from the adjuster. And I'm like, that's, that's not right because this thing is like all wedge until it rolls over on that spring and then it starts taking it out. That's bad. What am I going to do about that? Well, I can't figure it out because I've got, I've got a 200 in the left rear and a 150 spring in the right rear. And I've, I've got to have all this wedge. I need more wedge. And, and I've taken stagger out and the car's always loose and it's the fastest thing out there. So I go to Winchester and at Winchester with all the bank, like Bristol, I had a 500 and a 200 in it, 500 left rear, 200 right rear. And it's loose. And I'm down to a quarter inch of rear stagger and it's still loose. And I looked up under it and the springs away from it, an inch and a half. And I'm just pissed. So take that spring out. And I went out and I start out about 55 mile an hour and I speed up, speed up and everything's okay. So then I dive it down in the corner and it drags it back. And I'm like, you dummy. You got to put a 700 in the left rear. You just took 200 pounds of rear spring out of it. And if you're not going to have a right rear spring, you know, you got to up the 700, put the 700 in it. And the track record was 1604. We ran 50, uh, 1570, 74, broke it by three tenths. And, you know, it's just insane. So it's just, there's stories upon stories and layers to 1980. Also, at the end of 80 is when we start building. I decide, you know, it's time to try cup because they've just downsized the cars to the little cars and everybody's off base. You know, nobody's got it figured out. And this is my third year in a row winning the ASA chip chips time to build a car. So we start building that first cup car to do five races and uh, building a Bush car Xfinity. Now it's called for five races and I'm also going to run one ARCA race at Talladega. So I'm going to use the Xfinity car to get super speedway experience, but I'm going to run the cup car at short tracks where I think I probably know more about it than the guy, than the cup guys do. Mm. And uh, so there's a lot of story about building that car. And then 81 tells about, well, that car, that car had 60% left side weight junior. I mean, that, that cup car did. Wow. And there's a lot of interesting stories about the setup. It takes me to the third race to figure out the car good enough to get the pole. And then it takes me to the fourth race to figure out how to keep the car from burning the tires off of it. Well, it had 51% rear weight. And when I finally figured out it needed 51% front weight, then I started staying on my tires. We ran third at Martinsville and run seventh at Richmond with it. So that's what the, I had never been to a cup race garage or pit. I'd never been. All the thing I'd ever been is in the grandstands at Daytona and Talladega yeah. when I started running those five races. So, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in 80 and 81. So the funny thing about the, um, the car with the 700 left rear spring, no spring at all in the right rear <laughs> so um, <laughs> is so people talk about, Oh, that won't work. You know, uh, oh, everybody said it wouldn't work. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and they still say it today about setups and, and co- unconventional things. And, and you can't – it's just funny because uh, we were at uh, – this isn't out there too far, but we were at – I remember being in Atlanta. I think I was a rookie. Maybe it was 2001. And we had a two-inch uh, two, two and a quarter front bar, which in my mind at that time was giant. Mm-hmm. And I said to uh, – We'd been good in practicing, and I'm standing on the intro stage, and I'm standing with Mark, and I said, Mark, I, 
He's like, your car's pretty good. I said, yeah, it's got a big, giant front bar. It's like two and a half, two and a quarter front bar in it. I don't think it's going to be very good. It's probably going to get real That's tight. Right. And he looked at me and said, somebody's going to win a race with a two and a quarter inch bar in it. You might as well be you. Wow. Something along those lines. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> and it is, it really opened my mind up to um, being willing to try anything and be creative, innovative with your setups. And uh, when people tell you, oh, that won't work, or there's no reason why that would work, don't know you can't go that route. Mark Martin ran a car at Winchester with a 700 left rear spring and, and no in the right, right rear spring in it. I mean, that, that to me doesn't sound like it would work, but he was three-tenths faster than track record. Let me tell you one other thing about that, too. So as a Dillon house car, I had to give my setups out. So Bob <laughs> straight. So I did. And I would set cars up for a hundred bucks, which I came, your dad got a Dylan car and I came I to, yep. to the shop out back and, and set that car up for him. He gave me a hundred bucks. So hundred bucks cash was a lot of money to me at the time. And so I did that. Well, anyway, Bob straight, <laughs> uh, so had, Bob sorry. straight had it. Bob straight had a Dylan car. And so he, after I went down there and figured that setup out, he came in, uh, and wanted that setup. We put the setup in his car, and he sat on the outside pole. So it wasn't just yeah, wasn't but did, just me. No. But did, when he saw that for the first time, did he go, you're not telling the truth. This can't right. be right. <laughs> right. No, these guys thought I walked on water. Oh. They said, if you're doing it, we're, we're doing it. I hear you know, you. So, and uh, Now, he did run a 1603, so we still, <laughs> we still beat him pretty good. I mean, my cars were really good. The thing, is, the thing that I always did, you ran one car all year and you didn't try, you tried not to tear it up. And so when you'd bring it home, you would do your regular maintenance and then you'd spend the rest of the week grinding on something, sanding on something or pushing on the body a little bit or pulling or tucking to make the car better. So I, we never stopped it. We worked, me and Banjo worked 17 hours a day. You know, it would just work and work and work. And yeah. Always perfected those cars. So my cars were lighter than anybody's sure. that I raced against, except Blue. Yeah. Or Junior Hanley. Junior Hanley and Gary Blue really pushed me hard in the equipment area. Uh, Gary pushed me in the aero and made me really be proactive there. And Junior really pushed in the aero and the, the weight thing, too. So we were yeah. nuts. I mean, Anything a quarter of a pound was a lot of weight savings in in one time, you know, at one setting. Yeah, I try to talk to um, I try to talk to uh, our late model drivers that drive for us at Junior Motorsports to get them to read um, Gary's book and to learn more about Gary, more about you, more about that particular time, especially going down to the world, uh, the the Daytona Speed Weeks stuff, where basically it was kind of run whatever you want on the body. Um, but I, 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 I try to push my guys to learn, lean into y'all's careers and learn about them because of the innovation and yes. the creativity and how you and uh, Blue all kind of elevated each other and really made each other go as far as you possibly could on every little part and piece on the car, the body, and everything else. Because, you know, the guys today, they build the cars kind of like a kit, and then they take them out on the racetrack, and I look at the I look at the bodies and things, and I'm like, man, you're giving up so much opportunity, and it's all these little things that add up. And so uh, I encourage those guys to to dive back into that era, that that late '70s, early '80s sort of era of of uh, super late models and ASA, because that was a lot of ingenuity and stuff that still works today uh, that guys aren't even doing to their cars today. I know it. And, and Mark, your conversation with Gary Ballou on your podcast. I think I learned more about racing just at listening to you guys talk about this stuff than I have anywhere else. And, and it, it was amazing, and it, and it made me wonder, and hearing you were sort of giggling over here just listening to you talk about springs and, and, and setups, I always wonder, have you ever, you always seem to be the guy that didn't mind telling people what your setups were and helping with others. Have you ever told somebody, or have you ever misled them on your setup? Have you ever told somebody, a setup that was not actually what you were running. No, Rusty did though. I was standing right with Rusty. I went to <laughs> Rusty one night, and this guy come up and he said, "How much, Rusty? How much toe you run?" He said, "I run five eighths in." 
you know, and I'm like, Jesus, he's lying his tail off. You know? <laughs> but Rusty was always honest with me. We were always, I, if I hated a guy and he came up and asked me, I probably would have lied to him, but I never did hate anybody. Um, I was always willing to tell anybody what I had that w- w- it was an honor for me to me that they would ask me. Wow. If they'd come up and ask me, I was honored and I would be happy to tell them because I was going to beat them anyway. Wow. And, 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 you know, that was the way it was. I got into NASCAR and we talked a lot less, but still Rusty, if Rusty had three bad weeks in a row and wasn't running good, he'd come up and say, Mark, what he got? And I'd tell him everything. Same thing turned around. If I had to go, you know, running bad and couldn't find my way, I'd go to Rusty and ask Rusty what he had. And he'd tell me every bit of it, honestly. But I never did mind telling people what I had because I, I, but if you want one time when I lied, the first race I took my cup car, I knew cup cars had 125 to 150 pounds of lead. That's what a good, a normal cup car had short track cup car. Well, my cup car had 600 pounds of lead in it. Oh, <laughs> wow. And so, and this is in the 1981 podcast podcast. So Jake Elder, and I didn't know who he was. I was the first race was North of Wilkesboro and I qualified fifth, but I burned a gear up in the race and I was sitting on the, on the trailer fender of my open trailer, waiting for the pace shack to open up. And this guy walks up and he looks over in the car. He looks at me and he said, you only got two gauges. I said, yeah, that's all you need. Water temperature and oil pressure. He says, you ain't got no tack. And I said, no, you don't need one <laughs> because I was, you know, I was pretty full of myself at this point. In time. Yeah. <laughs> and then he, and then he says, how much lead you got in this car? And now Jake Elder's paying attention because he ain't never seen me before in his life, but he's seen this guy come that he don't know qualified fifth and he might not have been super educated, but he's smart enough to know he need to be looking at my car and see what's the heck's going on. So he said, how much lead you got in this car? And I wasn't prepared for that. I hadn't thought about anybody ever asking me that. So I lied and said 400 pounds. And he almost fell out. You know, Jake. Oh, Hell yeah. You know, you know how Jake was. He couldn't believe it. Then he looks at me and he says, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no. He said, J.C. Elder. And I looked at him like deer in the headlights because I didn't know what he. Who and then he you? said, Jake, Jake Elder. And I, oh, yeah. I, you know, I knew who Jake was. I didn't know who JC was. JC right. Elder. So all that, that those stories are in the 81 podcast. But yeah, yeah that's really the only time I ever really re- lie in about a setup. But you didn't even lie. You still, like, shot pretty high. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you still gave them something that blew their doors off, yeah. right? What, yeah. what, um, 81 was a tough year, though. So, um, you know, you drove for J.D. Stacy a couple races. Was that 82? That's 83. 83, ooh. So, um, 80, 82 and 83 were devastating career losers and demolished and, and <laughs> uh, took me from riding uh, high to completely on my knees. What happened? 82, uh, well, first of all, I didn't realize how hard it would be to run a full schedule because I ran five races. Mm. There was a month in between. We prepared for every race with my little guys. I, at that time, I had three full-time employees uh, in, in 81 doing those races and doing what I was doing. So I was not prepared for how hard it would be to run all the races. And I wanted to run all the races and run for Rookie of the Year. And I was running against Jeff Bodine in uh, the 50 car. Uh, and that was a, a good good team. Uh, really a winning team. Yeah. And so, so, um, and I did a deal with, uh, Apache Stoves for $50,000 sponsorship and they never, they, they went out of business, never paid, never paid. And so I didn't have any sponsorship and, uh, my crew chief at Daytona, uh, got, uh, inebriated the night before the 500 and didn't show up at the racetrack my goodness uh, sunday morning 
And so they, and then we blew up in the race. And so we left Daytona with a, a team in shambles, broke, no money. And, you know, it just, it was terrible. So by the end of 80, and then Jeff Bodine beat me anyway. Daryl Walter pleaded with me, Mark, please go to a limited schedule. You know, please. And I was just too hard headed and wouldn't give up. I was going to beat Jeff Bodine. Well, he beat me anyway. And so at the end of the season, I had to have an auction because I owned all my stuff. Yeah, it technically Bud Reader was called the car owner. What he did was he paid for the cars. And then I paid everything else. He didn't pay any bills. He just supplied me a car. It was like the house car deal I had with, with Dylan. Yeah. He gave Dylan gave me the car and then I operated it and then I gave it back when I was finished with it. And that was the same thing with Bud Reader. So I was broke and I and I owed heck, I owed Hutchinson Pagan, I think, fifty grand. So we had to have an auction and sell everything I owned. And I uh and I paid everybody off. And then Tim Richmond had drove for Stacy in the two car in eighty two and he had gone to Blue Max and it opened up the two car and he'd won a couple of races in that car. And yep. I got a shot at the car, but at the same time they shut off the money. The car was on the winter circle and Stacy had gotten another financial thing and shut off the money. So they were operating only on the you know, the winter circle money and the purse money. And so it was not the same thing. Dale Lemon wasn't there anymore. Dale Lemon left. He was had been the crew chief, and Booby Harrington was a crew chief. And I didn't think Booby was that good, and he didn't think I was that good. And after we ran uh, seventh at Atlanta on used tires and third at Darlington, we went to Martinsville early in the race, and I tangled with your dad and uh, uh, going into the corner and spun out and got hit and messed the car up. So I got fired uh, the next day. And they wanted to put someone in the car with more experience. So they put Morgan Shepard in the car. Um, and that left me pretty much in trouble. Morgan McClure came along, uh, but they were before they were any good. They had an old cut, cutlass that was horrendously pitiful, terrible. <laughs> G.C. Spencer was the crew chief. He was outdated. Damn. I was real progressive, and he was totally outdated. We didn't get along. They had a really nice speedway car. I got to drive at Talladega and ran good in. But uh, I, I I didn't get along with G.C. Spencer at the end of the year. I didn't call them back, and they didn't call me back. And so I picked up my stuff and moved back to Wisconsin and started my career all over again. Mm. Now, it was hard to start all over again. Let me tell you how hard it was. I had nothing, nothing to my name. And I, the first guy I called is Ray Dillon to get me my house car program. Mm. He said, Mark, the days of free cars are over. Wow. I, I, you know, I knew I could go to prototype and get an engine deal. Ron Neal, you know, had, had, uh, you know, been my engine program for since 81. And I had gotten them into NASCAR. Uh, they used prototypes at, uh, the, the Stacy thing. They closed up their engine in the two car engine program and use prototypes. And so I got on that in, engine deal down there in NASCAR and all. So I, I could get an engine deal, but I was going to have to find somebody that had a truck, a trailer and could supply me with cars. And they did. And one full-time employee. And so it was me and one other guy starting my career all over again and building the cars from scratch and hanging the bodies and, uh, and going back short track racing. And we had volunteer help that came in at night. So me and my guy, Doug Hahn, would work all day. We'd go in in the morning and work all day. And then at night, the help would come in, and then we'd stay and help work with the help all night. So it was a very tough time in my career. Humbling, Dale, I would not be the person I am today had I not failed because I was on such a roll before that for that 82 season, I, I was pretty full of myself. I was so full of myself that after that fifth race in 1981, when I sat on two poles, finished third and seventh with my own little car out of Indiana, the phone rang. I was, my shop was a pole barn. 
without insulation in Indiana, northern Indiana. The phone rang. It was a slimline phone on them dial phones. Hmm. I'm standing there. Answer the phone. Hello, Mark. This is Whitell Wilson. Like to see if you'd be interested in driving the 28 car. And I said, no, I'd rather do my own deal. <laughs> Whoa, that was it. That was it. So I could have been in the 28 car at the Daytona 500 in 1982. Wow. Holy. I'm not saying that would hire me. Sure. But I was scared to go drive that car. Because it was great at Daytona and Talladega, but Kale Yarbrough was a hell of a driver, yeah. and I and I didn't think those cars for everywhere else was as good as cars I could build. Right, mm. and I was afraid I would go down there and be strapped with cars that weren't good enough for me, because I believed at the time that the reason I won races is because I knew more about cars than everybody else. You get that, don't you? I, I do, mean, absolutely. But yeah, but, but when you lose everything, I, I'm a, I'd imagine it shook your foundation. Did you ever consider giving it up? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I thought about it, but what would I do? Right. I mean, my dad asked me if I wanted to come back to Arkansas and run the trucking business. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I race. Yeah. That's what I do. You know, I won the, you know, ASA three championships in a row. You know, I, 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 I've had, I, I race, man. I, I'm not gonna, that's what I do. And so I didn't even consider going back to Arkansas and I just dug in and started making phone calls and found uh, a guy in, in uh, Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, who had one late model and was willing to, build another one so that we'd have two, an ASA car and an art go car, one with a big body on it and one with a, you know, stocker body that would run ASA, uh, build a Handley car. And so we moved up there and I went to work and, um, and started my career all over again. 